Hi everyone, thank you so much for that warm welcome. My name is Sergeant Kaur, I'm an engineer at Google, which is across the street now, um, on the same street. Uh, and I'm so excited to be here, especially with teachers and educators. So many of you have helped shape who I am today, so it's great to be reflecting and sharing um, how you helped me become who I am today. Uh, so, uh, if you haven't realized, this presentation is just pictures of me. Uh, that's what it's going to be. No, uh, so, like I said, so many of you have helped shape who I am. So I thought I'd talk about today uh, some specific teachers in classrooms that really stuck out to me, stick out to me today, and a lot of what I learned in those classrooms, I still um, harbor on today, still learn, um, still use today. And also I'll be talking about uh, what I work on today and how you can integrate tech into your classrooms um, a little more seamlessly. So let's get started. Um, this is a pro tip. This is a really great way to integrate tech into your classrooms. Uh, now is when all of you start laughing because this is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a comic of a teacher or instructor on a TV telling students to just read off a book. Uh, and this comic really reminded me of a quote by Paulo Ferrier from the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He was an educator um, who's famous for his banking knowledge of education, um, saying that when we treat kids as these empty piggy banks or like empty vessels um, and teachers as these all-knowing powers who are just feeding in knowledge uh, without much interaction or creation, um, that doesn't result in great kids. So he has this quote, um, knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention, through the restless and patient continuing hopefully, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, with the world, and with each other. Um, and I pulled out uh, the words that really stuck out to me and also defined me uh, as I was growing up and defined me today. Invention, reinvention, restless, impatient, and inquiry. Um, my mom's in the audience, she can attest to how restless and impatient I am, uh, constantly curious. Um, I always just like to see, start to finish, how do these things work? No matter, uh, like, if it was a tool I was building or something I was using, like, who, how did this work? Um, and teachers were such a big part in, in cultivating that in me, uh, letting me ask those questions of why um, and explore my own creativity. Uh, and all of that was really harbored in the classrooms I was in uh, and with teachers I was really lucky to be in. Uh, one of the teachers that really stood out to me was Mrs. Troya, sixth grade, one of my favorite years in my academic journey. Uh, this is me dressed as Florence Nightingale in our wax museum. So. We were learning about history and we got to pick a historical figure. And so I was learning about history. I had to write up a whole report on it, learned about English, and I had to use my artistic skills to impersonate Florence Nightingale. But Mrs. Troya left a lot of room for my own creativity. So she was, put, she was like, go explore on your own. And that was a really big thing um, in those classrooms. Everything we did, uh, was, okay, here's, here's a history fact, here's something we're learning, here's all this room for you to explore that in your own way, show your own creativity. So in our wax museum, someone would come, a passerby would come, put their hand on a book, and I would start speaking. When they would leave, I would have to like freeze up again. Um, I think I got points off for not freezing up. Um, but like I said, she was like really encouraged critical thinking, um, and being interactive. And these are skills that I still use today as an engineer and also harbored a lot of confidence in me as a, as a public speaker, hopefully. One of the other classrooms I really want to talk about is journalism. Uh, I took high school journalism and it integrated so many different aspects of learning. I was an ads manager, so I had to rake in the money to, for us to print every month Hey, can we have a color spread this, this month? No, we don't have enough money. Why? So I was learning accounting skills. I was the news editor, so I had to be constantly in the know of, of current world events, but in a way that high school students would want to know about them, want to learn about them. I was writing opinion articles, 
So I was gaining my persuasive writing skills that so many English teachers love to give us uh, persuasive writing essays. So these are all these things I was learning and I was using technology, we, were, we had a blog, uh, I learned Photoshop, InDesign, so there's all these different skills I was using, but in a completely uh, inter interdisciplinary way. And I was making something from an empty page to the finish of like, we used, we used to have 30 page um, newspaper spreads. So seeing something from start to end, and that was so important to me. Um, and I was, I was learning about English, I was learning about all these different fields together. And one of the things I wanted to talk, uh, point out was, if our classrooms are interdisciplinary, that's so important because so many of the fields today, even as an engineer, are so interdisciplinary. I'll talk about what I work on uh, in a little bit later, but we use so many different skills. I don't just use math, I don't just use history. Um, there's so many different things I pull in and out um, into who I am or what jobs we do. So it's so important that our classrooms are also interdisciplinary. So that leads me to college. Uh, my teachers had done such a great job into making me uh, really curious about the world and uh, really curious about all these different fields and how they work together, that I, by the time I got to college, I wanted to be a journalist, I wanted to be a marine biologist, I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be all of these things, uh, and they didn't have a major called Save the World. And uh, so it was like, okay, I can't major in five, 50 different things, what am I gonna do? Well, I knew one thing I didn't want to do. I didn't want to sit behind a cube, I didn't want to sit behind a computer all day, um, and then come home and sit behind a computer again. I wanted to be interactive, I wanted to t like change the world, I wanted to see things start to finish, I wanted to see how things interacted, how people interacted with things. So I knew my dad sat behind a desk in a cubicle, so I was like, okay, I'm not gonna be that. I'm not gonna be a software engineer, because my dad did that. Lo and behold, look what I am today. <laughs> but really, how did I get into that journey? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey into computer science. So like every female going into computer science, my journey was really easy, really seamless. Um, it was just really, really fun. Um, unfortunately, not the case. Uh, I ended up picking computer science for multiple reasons, uh, one of which it, it was junior year in college and my counselor said, you need to pick a major. Uh, but what I really found was back to this idea of hey, I want to do something that is changing the world people are interacting with, and I don't know what it is right now, but I've come to realize that all these things kind of have this common overlapping tool that they're using, which is computer science. So anything I ended up doing uh, would probably need computer science, so why not be a computer scientist, gain those skills now, choose what I want to do later. And another thing that was great was I got to shadow an engineer at Microsoft right here, a um, little while away. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go shadow an engineer who sits behind a cubicle, let's see what happens. Well, this engineer was working on Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Word. These are tools that I was using nearly once a week, almost every day. There was someone who was putting a button somewhere, and when I clicked it, something was happening because of this person. And that was just mind-blowing to me. I was like, whoa, you're the person who makes this work. It's not magic. You're writing this. You're doing this. And that was incredible to me. I was like, okay, I want to do this. This is super exciting. Um, but I struggled so much. Uh, I decided not to put my transcript on here, but you'll have to believe me, it's not a pretty transcript. Uh, and it was such a hard, hard, like, two, three years of being in computer science. I went to school at Berkeley. And, well, one, there was really large classrooms, but two, I chose computer science a little later in the game, and when I walked into this classroom of 600 to 700 kids, it was just like a sea of gray. And there was just all these guys in hoodies. Like, they need to dress up a little more colorfully, but it was just like all these guys in hoodies, and there'll be like a pop of pink, a pop of like purple, and it'll be like a girl sitting in this like massive, massive uh, lecture halls. And it was, it was daunting, and all these, all these engineers had learned programming since they were so young, and I was just getting into it. So it was, it was a struggle. Um, and like, why is it that in high school, so many uh, females and males 
take math and science classes, um, like you, it, it, the statistic is that more females take science and math classes in high school, but by the time they get to college, only 18% of them um, of females are majoring in computer science. Um, so why is that? Is why we're doing such programs like this. But eventually, uh, this is a picture of me at my first internship um, at Symantec. Uh, I was an intern in the city, and one of the great things that really made me stick through and motivated me to stick through computer science was I really fell in love with the culture, with the environment um, in these technology companies. I had the chance to really be myself. I didn't have to dress up. I didn't have to talk uh, like really fancy. I just had to be me. I had to be creative. Uh, I was I was talking to the VP. I was like, hey, this isn't working. Like I was. It was such an open and flexible environment, and that's where I really got to be myself, uh, which was really great. The internship. Re these internships really helped me stick through computer science, even though I struggled at school. Uh, while doing this internship senior year, I decided to launch my own startup. Uh, it was an edtech startup to help students uh, who, were, who just had too many websites they had to go to to like, look at their homework and interact with uh, people have one website to go to. So I did a lot of user research. I pulled in my design skills on how to make this website really pretty. I talked to a lot of teachers, a lot, talked to a lot of students, and eventually that startup failed. But I learned so, so much, and all these failures accumulated together, all these struggles accumulated together into this. This is what I do at Google. Uh, the picture on the, on, uh, the left is, uh, is moving because it was taken by a non-muggle camera. Um, and so this is a carnival that happened a few months ago at Google. We all dressed up like Harry Potter. And every day I uh, make Harry Potter jokes. I uh, like I'm so comfortable in my environment as an engineer. Um, here is a picture of where I got to do a pastry internship at Google in one of our biggest kitchen staff. Uh, with our biggest kitchen staff, I was, I was uh, uh, making brownie batter for over 500 Googlers that day. Um, but why is it that Google lets engineers do things like that? because it fosters creativity, right? It fosters uh, you to be yourself. I love baking, I love Harry Potter. I'm so comfortable in my environment as an engineer with people who like, these, uh, like similar things. I get to be myself. Uh, this is a picture of my parents coming to take your parents to work day. Uh, this is my dad using cardboard. Um, so I wanna talk about this idea of interdisciplinary work and particularly for all of your students who are great at math and science, and you tell them, hey, you're gonna become great engineers, this is what you should do, because you're great at math and science. Well, those students who are failing your math classes, who are failing your science classes, might be great engineers, uh, or even better engineers as well, because engineering is such a, such a wide like, array of, of tools that we use. Uh, New York Fashion Week just ended. Uh, the designer, Zach Posen, uh, launched a dress uh, that someone had programmed. So we're integrating fashion, the fashion industry, New York Fashion Week, with programming. It was a, it was a dress uh, made of LEDs and that was like blinking at different times. It was wonderful, really, really gorgeous. Entertainment industry. Uh, my sister wants to go work at Pixar. I think a regular Pixar engineer has a degree in art, physics, engineering, and a whole bunch of other things. But these are the engineers that are making us laugh or making us go to the movie theater and be happy or sad uh, or uh, talk about so many of these characters that like, so many people get to see. Gaming, I'm, su I'm sure a lot of your students love gaming on their phones, uh, on, on their consoles, so many of that, but how are these games coming to be? Um, what's getting kids addicted to, them, uh, to these games? Well, ask your students, hey, do you love this game? Yes, I love this game. Do you like playing it? Yes, I love playing it. Well, wh why is it that you love playing it? Like, what are these things that are enticing you? What if we could do something a little differently that would make this game better? Ask these questions to help them, like something that they love to do, um, but harbor creativity while doing it. Sports, a friend of mine wants to be an NBA recruit. Well, one of the basic things that they ask for an NBA recruit, 
is do you know programming? Because they need to figure out statistics, they need to figure out, hey, who's the best player? And they make all these programs for it. NBA recruits in, in, in sports. I have a friend who wants to be a meteorologist. Uh, and what do they need? They need to know Pynum. They need to know how to make automation scripts so, so they can f like manipulate all these numbers. And these are just some examples of like the, this like cross-disciplinary engineering work that's happening, which is really incredible. This leads me to what I work on today. I'm a back-end engineer on Google My Maps. Um, some of you might have heard of it. It's a tool for making, viewing, and sharing custom maps. So you can go to mymaps.google.com, and then you can make a map and see it anywhere uh, on desktop, mobile, Earth, uh, and embed it in your own websites. So you go to mymaps.com, you can add points, uh, add photos to those points, uh, or you can find places, save them onto a map, uh, you can draw lines, you can draw shapes, you can measure that area of, of that region. Um, you can get directions, save that, and like, make these beautiful, beautiful maps that you can view on, on your phone, um, on Google Maps, on Google Earth. Uh, I'm, I'm blowing past this because I'm going to give a demo too as well. So, uh, and even embed on your uh, website's uh, tide pool field trip. Uh, and then you can also collaborate on these maps with your students. So all of your students can go on a map and add points together. Uh, you can import data from spreadsheets or KML and then share these maps on Facebook, Twitter, or on your websites. But particularly, how can you use my maps at schools? So the obvious example is geography, map, geography. Um, but there's also so many examples in history, math, the arts um, and activities that you can really use my maps. Uh, geography, for example, in first and second grade, ancestry was a really big thing. Well, why not get all of your students to put where they came from on a map? I come from a really tiny state called Punjab in northern India, and it's known for amazing food. Let me put it on a map and share it with my, uh, with my peers and my teachers. And you can enrich these maps with so much multimedia content to really bring a visual element into what, people, uh, what kids are learning. What if you take a field trip to a park? Well, let's map it out. What did you see? Let's draw polygons. Um, so this is a great example of mapping out a park. In history, uh, Taking history and mapping it out on a modern map is so crazy. You get to see, hey, why is it that we have such uh, metropolitan uh, cities in certain areas? Well, a lot of uh, travelers came by that. There's so much history to that area. If you map it out on a map, you see that. Um, this is a Lewis and Clark's journey up the Mississippi River, and that's where a lot of our settlements are or cities are now. Um, so if you map it out on a map, you really see this connection from the historical world to the modern world. Uh, this is a great map of uh, Nelson Mandela uh, that someone made. And it's just a whole bunch of points, but it's bringing what, thing, uh, what students love to be on, YouTube, finding all these YouTube videos of Nelson Mandela's great, great speeches, and enriching this map with multimedia content of all the speeches that he did and in what locations. Uh, in math, okay, if you're doing unit conversions, you're, you're teaching them proportions, well, how, how big is your school? How big is your house? How big is your room? Uh, do unit conversions on it. Uh, just a great way to add a visual element instead of uh, giving them examples in a textbook to, uh, to convert um, numbers. Or even how big is the state? Just add four points in some cases. And the arts. So this is a really cool example of, of a map that someone made about Mozart. Um, if you map out all the, all the places that uh, really big events happened in his life and, and then see how it reflected in the music that he made, it's incredible to see the journey he took and how it really helped shape the, mu uh, the music and who he was. So adding, adding maps to the arts is a great example. 
or even a book report. This is a great map that a teacher made on the novel My Brother Sam is Zed on all the points that happen and then uh, visualizing that on a map so students can look, see what they're, what they're reading but then help uh, engage with that as well on a map. And lastly, activities. Obviously a great example is for a field trip. If you have a field trip to the tide pools, for example, we have so many tide pools. How do you get the parents to show, their, show up there on time? Well, make this map, save it, share it with the parents. They can pull it up, pull it up on their phones and uh, meet you right there. Or um, this is a really cool example of uh, these first graders um, who are uh, advocates for black bears in their area. So they made this uh, like incredible map. They also have a blog with this, and it's called Neighborhood Watch, and they're adding points uh, and doing their first grade activism to save black bears, but really engaging in different ways and cultivating uh, their creativity in different ways. Uh, football schedules or baseball schedules, like if you don't know where a field is, uh, put it on a map, share it, you're done. Um, you have it for this season. So Mr. Sill actually has uh, some great classroom examples. He's just a teacher who loves my maps, but there's so many resources he's put on his blog, um, and you can check them out there. We also have a lot of sample maps at sites.google.com slash samples, and that leads me into a demo. So uh, this is what I was talking about, the sample maps that we have. Um, you can pick continents, uh, countries, states. We have a Civil War map, the Lewis and Clark map. Um, you can take these maps and then you can also view them in 3D, like this. Um, and it's just incredible to like look at these maps in, uh, um, in a 3D, uh, 3D way and engage with them. Uh, and this is Mr. Soul's map that I was talking about. One of the maps he made was uh, Flat Stanley's Journeys. Uh, I remember doing Flat Stanley in like third grade. Well, where's Flat Stanley been? And you can look at a bunch of related maps for that. Uh, you can go to mymaps.google.com. You can add points of anywhere you want to go. You can add driving routes. You can measure distances. Um, you can uh, measure the area of certain things. Um, one of the really fun things is, I'm going to actually uh, share that, is you can do a KML download um, of the United States and then import all the states into your map. Once you've imported all the states from a map, you can move these locations to different areas. You take uh, the, the state of Alaska and you try to uh, overlap it um, uh, on Africa and you see how tiny Alaska really is. And that just gives uh, the students a way to interact and see sizes and proportions. Um, it's one of my favorite examples of just like, oh wow, that's super tiny. Um, and it helps you visualize things. Uh, that's one great example. Um, and then, uh, just uh, some other resources. So we talked a lot about really motivating um, your students in cross-disciplinary ways. If they're not good at math, maybe they're good at art. Well, it, engineers are not good at everything. They all have like specific things that they're good at. Girls Who Code is a great program. Uh, my sisters were actually part of. It's a free program um, specifically for girls. Um, I would encourage all of your students or female students to apply for it. Um, and these girls get to learn to code at places like Facebook. My sister was at Facebook for seven weeks where she interacted with engineers there and really learned how to code um, from A to Z even and like design their own apps. 
um, Code Academy. This is for you and your students. Uh, these are, um, it just has a lot of great tutorials and uh, interactive examples on learning Python, learning JavaScript, learning HTML, just basic skills, and it has really great examples. Google, Google, uh, there's probably a field trip of students um, and teachers coming by Google nearly every week. I get emails about, hey, can you, uh, like, do you want to help volunteer for a field trip? Um, Google.com diversity um, is a great place of programs, scholarships for students, scholarships for teachers. Um, there's Google for education, all these things that you can engage with uh, for your students and for yourself. And there's many more. These are just a few examples, uh, which concludes the presentation. Feel free to email me. I can email you this slide deck. Uh, if you have questions uh, about using my maps, uh, about any other resources, about wanting to come visit Google, about wanting to bring your students there, um, shoot me an email. Uh, I'd love to uh, uh, respond. Yeah, and now we'll take it for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sargon. Excellent. Now, I'm sure many of you have a few questions that you'd like to ask, so anything is welcome. And we'll alternate sides of the room, so we'll start over here. Hi there, my name's Amber. I have two questions for you. Do you mind putting up Mr. Sill's URL one more yeah. time? And then, um, what was the file type that you were importing for the states? KML. KML. Yes. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's for use for like longitude, latitude points. Uh, and you can find a lot of uh, a lot of data already on um, online. So Mr. Sill have like has a lot of data sets that you can easily import in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on the other side? No. Hi, my name is Nancy. I wanted to find out what age group do you think would be good to expose kids to coding? Yeah, I. I think there's a there's a ten year old coming up a little while after. I think even if you even if not coding, I think critical thinking skills are so important, and you can start doing that on day one, right? With kindergartners, just be like, be creative, be yourself, right? You don't have to bring technology into the classroom to make computer engineers. I didn't have technology in my classroom, but I had teachers who were just integrating so many different things like arts, sciences. Um, some of the basic courses that they can learn are like HTML and science. One of a great program actually is called Scratch, um, and Scratch tutorials is just like little figurines that you are like dragging and dropping, and it's just helping you think uh, in a logical way um, that le leads on to computer science. Um, so you can, Scratch is maybe I would say even like in fourth grade, third grade, kids can start doing. But it's just harboring those creativity skills, I think, are much more important. OK, we have one over here in the front. Oh, hi. Yeah. Great Quidditch photo. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Brian Van Dyke, I noticed in your slides that you, I'm trying to stay away from that speaker. Um, could you, I know the teachers in this room would love to hear about Jerome Berg's Google Lit Trips, which I noticed a few of your slides we're using some of the stuff that he has yeah. worked on, and maybe you could talk about that. The, some of the examples? With the Google Lit Trips, yeah, in particular. Yeah. Uh, let me. So this one? Yeah, that one and the one that you did about the one novel that you have. Yeah, this is the novel one. Yeah. So here, so you can look at so points. So in chapter one, where were they, right? You put a point on the map. This is where they were. Chapter two, where did they go? I particularly myself have not read this book, but this was a really cool map. Chapter two, where, they, where did they go? And then you see this, uh, they've drawn an arrow just to show like passing of time. They went from this location to that location. And as a student, I, I love reading books, so that's, that's great. But okay, this and this happened, I don't really put it on a, uh, visually, I don't put it together. I, I read the book, I put it away, and that's it. But if I visually put it together, that's so important to me. And even if I'm like studying for a test later on, 
you go back to chapter one, and if you, you can embed photos into that, into that point, you can embed videos, you can embed your own notes. A student can write their own notes. So say each student got a copy of this map and then added their own notes to every point for every chapter. It's an incredible way for them to just collaborate, collaborate and put together their knowledge into one place, um, in a visual place. Um, and then there was the example, I think, of there's the Lewis and Clark example, obviously, of like historical movements. The Oregon Trail would be an, another exa great example to show on a map. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, Tim, Tim Hilborn, uh, I was just wondering, as far as a presentation, do you think it's easiest, like if you have the student come up and do a presentation, is it easiest to do the presentation off of this or import it into slides and use it? What, what's your opinion of, of how they would? Yeah. So you're saying if a student used my maps? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could take a standstill screenshot of a my map map, but I think what would be even cooler was to, it's so easy to engage with a map. Uh, uh, I, I can pull one up, but if they pulled up their own map and did a presentation on that, because you click on a point and say, hey, this is the video or picture that relates to this point. Uh, and then what if someone says, well, hey, that, that place is like 10 minutes away from my house. Put another point right then and there and say, hey, this historical event happened 10 minutes away from my house. Let's measure the distance. There's so many ways that they can inter interact with. Um, I think they could, given no technical difficulties, obviously it's easier if you take a screenshot, put it into a presentation, but uh, for them to just showcase their map, what, 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 what areas did they really focus on um, on a map, so forth? Great, we have another question over here. Hi, my name is Nafisa Mustafa. I have a question about creativity. You mentioned several times that your instructors um, incorporated quite a bit of creativity into the classroom and you know, it made a difference for you as a student and in your learning. Um, you know, we have Common Core curriculum now and different things happening in our schools. What, what, what are some tips you can give us as educators, as teachers, about the, that creativity piece? Uh, I definitely think your jobs have gotten harder. Uh, my sisters are in high school, um, and teaching to a strict uh, list of like A, B, C things is, is difficult, but I think there's still ways to incorporate just, hey, if they're writing an essay, why don't they, why don't they make it, why don't you make a magazine for that, uh, for that week or for that month, right? We'll put all those essays together into a magazine. Uh, one person writes a pers persuasive essay, so they write an opinion article. Uh, one person writes an, a biography. So there's like these things that, common things that they're doing, but I think students always have the question, why am I learning this? I'm never gonna use this in my life ever again. Well, why don't we bring those examples and show them thing, the ways that people, adults, are, are using things that they're learning right now in their real world lives um, would make a really big difference. Um, it's just, it takes a lot of creativity on the teacher's part as well into imagining these things, but I think it goes really long ways for the students. I think the, one of the biggest thing is probably just leaving room for the student to add their own personality or flavor into whatever they're learning. Even if it is history, let them add their own flavor to it um, would be really important. Hi, I'm Rome. Um, so you mentioned that growing up, you didn't want to be like your dad who sat in a cubicle. Um, I've heard um, Googlers are at work for many long hours. How many, like, how long are you in a cubicle programming all the mind maps? Yeah. And how can we sell it to kids um, and yeah. not have that, like, negative yeah. view of it? Um, so I don't sit in a cubicle. Uh, my desk is, uh, is, I have, like, a standing desk, and it's, like, an open space plan where I'm constantly, like, diverting Nerf guns and like that's all real. What you see in these pictures most of the time is actually honestly real. Uh, and 
like the pictures I showed, like it, I got to be myself. I make Harry Potter jokes while standing and doing work. It's not like, okay, I sit in, like on my desk for eight hours and I'm straight coding. Like there's always things I'm going to, I, I've taken so many cooking classes at work, right? So th the way that I, students get motivated, um, my sisters didn't want to be engineers. They took part in Girls Who Code and now want to become engineers is because just show them the culture, right? Do you, and there's so many different ways uh, and creativity and, and things they get to do, um, especially at Google. It's not just sitting at, at your desk. You, there's so many different avenues. I can take my laptop and I can go work outside um, in a hammock, right? Like these spaces are opening up. Um, and I think a lot of students, when they come and see it, uh, are really fascinated by it. Um, yeah. Okay, we have another question over here. Hi again. So the My Maps tool, I'm not familiar with it. It looks like a student can have their own instance of a My Map. Does it work similar to Google Docs where I can also have something that we can collaborate on, you can share, you can edit, and everybody can work on one map? And, and my apologies if I didn't grasp that, but I just wanted to call out yeah. and make sure we can collaborate on a single map easily, and that's supported. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, and we're making that tool even better, collaboration tool. Um, I want to be honest, it's not at the level of Google Docs right now uh, because it's harder to do, do it on a map, but every day, like literally my assignment right now is to make that better. Um, but you can definitely do it, add mo a bunch of collaborat collaborators together. People are working and adding on different points to a map uh, on the same map. Great, we have time for just a couple more questions. Hi, I'm Jyoti Rani, and you've been talking to all these adults and educators about your job, but um, on a different topic, there are eight kid volunteers here today that we attended this um, program before, and on behalf of them, I would like to ask you one moral, one important thing that we should remember in our lives that you can share with us that would help us. Okay. Um, I was watching a lot of presentations of rock stars before and all the great questions came from the kids. And I think that's a great question. Uh, before on the first slide, I had this, uh, this quote about failing, like build, fail, um, learn and iterate. I have uh, really struggled into becoming an engineer and constantly failed. And I wasn't a great programmer um, in the beginning. Uh, hopefully I am now because then my maps wouldn't be working. Uh, but I think it's just like accept yourself to fail um, and not be demotivated by it. Um, my sister, is, one of my sisters is not a math and science person and she's really struggling to say like, what am I going to become? What am I going to do? And I was like, it's okay if you're failing in math and science. There's so many options for you to still become an engineer. She's an amazing engineer. She's a, high a senior in high school. Um, but not to be demotivated um, by struggles that you go through. Yeah. Great. Any final questions from anybody over there? No? OK. So, oh, yeah, we have one more over there. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Holly Green. And I was wondering, for my maps, do you think would it work for like school presentations if you were to present to your teacher or is there a way you can just share it? Cause like at my school we, we use a lot of Google Docs. Yeah. Is there a way you can just share it? And like, is, is there a way you can check if they can edit or if they can just view or if they can comment? Is there a way to do that? Yes, definitely. So you can actually create my maps right through Google Drive. So, you know, if you go to Google Drive, you say click new doc slides. There's also an option for creating a my map. And then you can do whatever you want on it, and then you can share it with your teacher, um, who can also edit it, who can uh, only view it, whatever you want to do. Um, it works very similarly to a Google Doc, and that's one of our missions is to make maps a one, of, a one of the ways that people aggregate information just like they do on a, on a slide or a document or a spreadsheet. A map is just another way um, to add information um, and put it together and share it with the world. Great question. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I just have one final question. I'm going to come up and join you for a second. I have one final question before we wrap up here. Um, 
one of the typical questions I ask is, what would you, what, what advice would you give? And I think that that advice stands for teachers, educators, uh, both in and out of the classroom as well as students. Um, and I guess I have one final question for you because you're doing all these incredible things and you've really learned how to overcome some of the um, challenges that you've had to face in both trying things and some failure you've talked about. So where do you see yourself going in the future? What are some of the challenges you want to take on as you go forward? Uh, I think that idea of wanting to uh, really help the world is still there. I get to, my maps has millions of users every day, so that's pretty incredible to be working on something that millions of users are working on. But I was closely in, like working with, not working with, or keeping in contact with people, our engineers who went um, to Africa during the Ebola crisis, and they were building tools for that. And that's somewhere I want to be. I want to be a great engineer and harbor skills that I can be working on things like that in the future. Amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. Big round of applause.